This is a fan-generated show. If you'd like to support us, please go to jamieglazov.com. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our new Rumble channel. All your support is greatly appreciated. Good evening. Welcome to the Glazov Gang. Tonight, our very special guest, Morton Klein, the national president of the Zionist Organization of America. He is widely regarded as one of the leading Jewish activists in the United States. Mort Klein, what an honor to have you on the program. Well, it's an honor to be with you. I've known about your work for many, many years. I'm thrilled to finally meet you in, per in person through Zoom. Fantastic. It's great to have you here. Mort, why don't we just begin with the ZOA, if I'm correct, founded in 1897, the oldest Zionist organization in America. Tell us a little bit about your group. The ZOA.org. ZOA is the oldest uh, pro-Israel group in the United States, founded in 1897. Past presidents include Ju the Supreme Court Justice Louis Brandeis, Stephen Wise, Abba Hill of Silver. They're some of the famous names that have led this organization. <laughs> uh, ZOA was, was uh, created, established in order to fight for the reestablishment of the state of Israel. Which happened about 50 years after ZOA's uh, establishment. Today we have full-time lobbyists on Capitol Hill. Uh, we have a legal division using the courts to promote uh, a pro-Israel agenda, and also using it to protect Jews from discrimination and harassment and bigotry on campuses. And, uh, and we have a campus division. We're in almost 100 campuses throughout the country. Uh, the disseminating materials, bringing in speakers uh, to tell the truth of the Arab Islamic war against Israel. We also have two missions to Israel with, uh, that students go to each year, one for adults. The one for adults, by the way, is going to be uh, June 11th to the 18th in a, in a couple of months, a month or two. And uh, I write regularly in the op-eds in the papers. I appear on TV and radio. I lecture all over the country. I spoke only three nights ago at Columbia University. And uh, I found it astonishing uh, how little college students know of, uh, of, of really what's going on in the Middle East. So, uh, and, and we are the only major Jewish group that opposed the Oslo agreements, predicting it'll lead to disaster, opposed the Gaza withdrawal, where 10,000 Jews were thrown out of their homes from Gaza and Northern Samaria, predicting it'll lead to Hamas rockets. And we're the only significant Jewish group that opposes the establishment of a Palestinian Arab state because it'll be an Iran Hamas terrorist dictatorship. Right now, it is a terrorist dictatorship. Uh, the president of the Palestinian Authority was elected in 2005. There have been no elections since. Uh, so uh, we take positions totally different from the mainstream Jewish groups, and they've been wrong about almost uh, everything. And, on, and tragically, frankly, it's, uh, we've been correct about the positions we've taken. Absolutely, more. Where you and I are very close is that, well, in many ways, but. I've dedicated my life because of my background. My parents were dissidents in the Soviet Union. Uh, communism wiped out so much of my family, so many of my people. I was always fascinated with the left in the West and this suicidal tendency of leftists, and it has many realms. And Kenneth Levin, that wrote The Oslo Syndrome, very close to my heart, how he described that syndrome. And that's the syndrome that you're fighting against. And I want to talk about that today. Um, but let me, let's fill in some of these puzzles one step at a time. You have a very fascinating personal story rooted in, in, in pain and tragedy, as is often the case with people that end up on the front lines fighting for justice. You're the child of Holocaust survivors. You were born at a displaced persons camp in Germany. Tell us a little bit about your background. My father was a Hasidic rabbi. My mother is Lubavitch, both very religious Jews. Uh, they were in uh, Auschwitz. Uh, uh, my father lost his first family, eight brothers and sisters, everyone. He was left alone. My mother lost half her family. They met in a displaced persons camp in, uh, um, in Neu-Ulm, N-E-U-U-L-M, Neu-Ulm, Germany, uh, where they married. And... Uh, my father worked as a rabbi in very small synagogues, uh, not making a very good living. And uh, in fact, until I was 16, we lived in all black neighborhoods. Uh, virtually all my friends were black until I was 16 years old. They were my buddies. Uh, 
uh, ran around with them, played ball with them. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> then uh, I went to college, studied mathematics and statistics. I became a biostatistician. I worked with the, the greatest chemist who ever lived, two-time Nobel Prize winner, Linus Pauling, <laughs> most famous for structural chemistry. Is, he discovered electronegativity, uh, hybrid orbitals, the structure of the alpha helix. <laughs> Almost everything you study in general chemistry, Linus Pauling discovered. <laughs> Uh, I worked with him on nutrition and disease. I wrote uh, many medical papers with him on the value of nutrients in preventing and treating disease. And uh, <laughs> then my, my wife started complaining to me that I'm not doing anything for, for Israel or the Jewish people. She said, you're, you're, you're not using your talents to help our, uh, our people who are being bashed in the media uh, virtually every day. And uh, because I was worried about losing her respect, I began to read everything I could on Israel because I didn't know anything. And uh, once I uh, uh, gained a sufficient knowledge, and one day my daughter came home from high school, I looked at her high, uh, uh, high school history textbook, uh, I found that every paragraph about Israel had at least one line. Every paragraph had at least one line in it. To make a long story very short, I went to a school board meeting, uh, uh, publicly complained at the meeting about this textbook. I went through the errors. I said it has to be thrown out. Uh, superintendent supported me. We forced DC Heath's The Enduring Vision uh, to re uh, re rewrite that textbook. I did the same with the oldest travel book company in the world, Bedeker's Travel Guides to Israel and Jerusalem. Had 100 er anti-Israel errors. Uh, I wrote two articles about it in the Jerusalem Post. They invited me to come. Bedeker's guide invited me to come to Germany. I met with the board. I demanded it be rewritten. I rewrote the guide, and that's how. I, and then I did many other things. But that's how I became known to the Jewish world. People from ZOA came to me and said, "We want you to run for president." I said, "I don't want to be president. I don't know how to be president." They said, "You can't win. You're running against an incumbent. But we think if you run, it'll make him more of an activist." And I said something a politician will never say. I said, if you promise me I won't win, I'll run. So I ran. And in fact, I ended up winning. And I've been doing this for 30 years. So uh, that's a, a, a small nutshell of, of uh, what I've been doing throughout my life. Fascinating story. Um, I have a couple questions. If it wasn't for your wife nudging you, in that direction and you becoming ZOA president and a, an activist, would you have been perhaps an NBA player? You said you were good in basketball or you played basketball or you would have become a great economist. What do you think would have happened? Actually, my sport was baseball. I was a uh, all city little league third base. I hit for power. I batted third in the lineup. Uh, and in fact, I was so good uh, when I was young uh, that my coach said, it's a shame you observed the Sabbath because I think you would have a, a possibility of, of making it in the majors, which is quite an extraordinary statement. Uh, wow. Uh, but with the Sabbath, I never played in the Sabbath. So that, uh, that ended my possibility of any career. Uh, plus I in high see. school, they only played on the Sabbath, Friday nights and Saturday games. So my career ended. Interesting. More, there were those Jews during Oslo and after who were saying, let's just give some hugs, let's just give some money, let's just give some land and everything will be okay. Let's give Gaza over to Hamas and everything will be okay. And there were some Jewish administrators that when you went and tried to fix those textbooks, it wasn't the Christians that tried to stop you. It wasn't even necessarily, maybe even some anti-Semites. It was the Jewish administrators that tried to stop you from fixing those textbooks. The chairman of the board of the Lower Marion High School, Lower Marion School District, uh, was a woman. Uh, and she and some other Jews got in touch with me <laughs> after I met with the uh, school board and, and protested about the textbook and said, drop this immediately. You're only going to increase anti-Semitism. I was called by the head of the JCRC, the Jewish Community Relations Council in Philadelphia, called them for a meeting demanding that I stop my campaign to change the textbooks, uh, travel guides. They also said, you're just gonna increase anti-Semitism. I said to them, look, I don't work for you. You, you have no right no, you, you have no right to tell me what to do. I mean, I guess you can give me your opinion, but I'm gonna continue doing it. No, and I went to Abe Foxman of ADL, had no interest, no interest in this. Look, I was an unknown guy. I was just a, 
I was just a guy. Nobody knew who I was. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, I went to AJ Committee in Philadelphia. Same. No interest. So I decided to do it on my own. So the Jewish organizations, even then, I'm talking about this is like 1989, 1990, refused to do anything about these textbooks and travel guides. I did it on my own. I forced them both to change. Thank you for being such a courageous person who fights for the truth. You know, Stockholm Syndrome, it's a fascinating thing in how it enters so many besieged communities. No, it's interesting. The non-Jewish members of the Lower Marion School Board, they were furious about the textbook. They wanted it changed, not because they cared about Israel. It was not an interest of theirs. They didn't want their kids learning falsehoods about, uh, about history and about the world. Mm -hmm. That's why they were upset. Mm -hmm. So they supported me. The Jewish members, members, plural, of the school board were against my moving forward. They say that on the plane of one of those on 9-11, Muhammad Atta said, everybody be quiet and sit still and everything will be okay. And things didn't turn out to be okay. Uh, so we'll be discussing this Stockholm Syndrome uh, that affects the Israeli and Jewish communities as we go forward. Uh, you have never fallen into that syndrome. You also knew very well what the Oslo Accords would result in. And that also led to criticism of you within the Jewish community, didn't it? I was bitterly attacked by, uh, you know, ADL, the Conference of Presidents, as the umbrella group of the organizations, uh, uh, articles calling me an extremist and a warmonger. Uh, it's rather remarkable. What I said was Yasser Arafat, then the head of the Palestinian Authority, <laughs> was violating every aspect of Oslo. In other words, this was not some special insight that I had. <laughs> he was supposed to arrest terrorists. He didn't. He was supposed to extradite him to Israel. He didn't. He was supposed to change the PLO covenant that called openly for the destruction of Israel and, and, and murdering Jews. Uh, he was supposed to change his textbooks, which promoted violence and hatred against Israel and Jews. Uh, he did none of this. So I saw after a month, you know, I thought that was a long time already. After a month, he's doing none of this. And I wrote a series of articles condemning it and saying Israel must immediately stop the process. They must make no more concessions, no negotiations until Arafat starts to fulfill his obligations. So I said, he's not, he's not interested in peace. It wasn't because of a special insight. I, I simply saw he was not violating everything he was supposed to do under the Oslo agreements. And people would say to me, uh, leaders whose names you would know, uh, it takes time. This is only a month or two. And, you know, the, the, so eventually they're going to fulfill everything. Everything is fine. So I had to uh, do everything really on my own. No other Jewish group of significance came out against the Oslo agreements. No other significant Jewish group. And, and I was bitterly attacked. This is in 1994. I was bitterly attacked as a warmonger extremist trying to destroy my credibility because I was promoting uh, uh, a, a, a belief that they wanted nothing to do with. These people, I call them uh, frightened appeasers. They're scared of, of yeah. the enemies of the Jews. They want to appease them, thinking if we have, give them what they want, they'll stop hating us and killing us. They are frightened appeasers. And as uh, Winston Churchill said, appeasement always fails. Those mm -hmm. who oppose the crocodile, those who uh, appease the crocodile will simply be eaten last. It doesn't yeah. work. And throughout history, it's been shown appeasement mm -hmm. has never, fit, has never, never worked. Absolutely. And those people who pointed those accusatory fingers at you and called you names, the Israeli children, the women, the Israeli men who have died, who have been maimed, who have been mutilated for years till this day, little kids have to run when they hear a siren to a bombing shelter because Hamas is launching uh, rockets from Gaza. The people that pointed the fingers at you, they're, they're hands are drenched in the blood of the Israelis that have been hurt by Hamas. Isn't that right? It's not just Hamas. It's Fatah it's, yeah. and many other Arabs. And uh, since Oslo, 2,000 Jews have been murdered in terrorist yes. attacks, 10,000 maimed, 10,000 maimed. And by the way, in the last year, there have been 5,000 terrorist attacks in Israel. 
We don't know this. The media doesn't talk about it. Uh, and only in the last few weeks, we've seen uh, about 15 or 20 Jews have been murdered. Two sets of brothers, uh, 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 two sisters and their mother. And by the way, the media al almost says nothing about it. <laughs> and what's more astonishing, these people who have murdered Jews are paid a lifetime pension by the Palestinian Authority. I just spoke at Columbia. When I mentioned that, they, the kids said, this can't be. They just couldn't believe this can be true. because They never heard of it. And they never heard of it because Jewish leaders don't talk about it. And I'm sorry to say, Israeli leaders don't talk about this monstrous, heinous, Nazi-like policy to pay Arabs lifetime mention to murder Jews. And let me tell you something else. The pension that they're paid is five times the rate of an average salary of a Palestinian. It is very lucrative to murder Jews. And once they kill a Jew, if, if, they're, if they're killed, posters are, are, are put up about them, calling them a hero and a martyr in all the high schools, the colleges. They're glorified throughout the Palestinian areas. Uh, so, uh, and people, when I told people this, they don't know this. By the way, a recent poll, two weeks ago, Palestinian poll, do you support the murder of these brothers and sisters in the last few weeks? 71% said yes. Is this not horrifying? Why is that a headline in the New York Times and the Philadelphia Inquirer and Washington Post? Imagine if that was a poll among the Jews. Do you support murdering a, an innocent Arab? And it was 71% of Israelis said yes. The world would go crazy, as they should. And, and here they have this policy of paying Arabs to murder Jews. And, and it's not even talked about in the UN or in the media. <laughs> and, tr and we passed a law, the Taylor Force Act, to stop to restrict aid to the Palestinians, all they have to do is stop paying Arabs to murder Jews. Donald Trump cut all $500 million and they cut it off because they didn't change that policy. Biden has ignored that law and has given them not only 500 million, 800 million to the Palestinian Authority of our money goes to the terrorist dictatorship that murders Jews and Americans. Taylor Force, who was murdered by an Arab in Tel Aviv, was an American Christian. More, let's crystallize this. There's an entity that pays its people to kill Jews. It's very open about it. It comes to a U.S. president and very openly, this is out in the open, we kill Jews, we pay our people to kill Jews, give us some money, and Biden hands the money over, right? $800 million of U.S. taxpayer money. And when Israelis are killed by Palestinian terrorists, Biden's money is involved in that. Uh, money is fungible. It can be used anywhere. Yeah. He spends $400 million a year paying Arabs lifetime pensions to murder Jews and who have murdered Jews. This $800 million helps them do this. It's, it's an out. Imagine if Israel paid Jews to kill Arabs. Imagine. It, it yeah. sounds so hor horrible. We can't even imagine. Mm. The world would go ballistic if that were the case. Yet that is the case of the Palestinian Arabs, and no one says a word, including Jewish leaders in America and Israeli leaders. How many times when they go on TV and radio do you hear them bringing up this subject? Virtually never. And more, so you say something, but you're denounced, including also, of course, as we're saying, by Jewish leaders. Then, for instance, Black Lives Matter. In their own mission statement, at least at one time, because they're constantly revising it, they were a, they were promoting, you know, transgender and all that stuff. They were clearly against the black male, the black father. They had all this trans stuff in there, all this leftist stuff in there. But they also had anti-Israeli elements in their mission statement. So they were very open about this. You took a stand against Black Lives Matter that is very clearly anti-Israel. Again, who denounces you for that stand? Jewish groups. Their charter of Black Lives Matter, the group, not black people, the group called Black Lives Matter, uh, charter says Israel is a genocidal apartheid state that shouldn't exist. And they said, and listen to this, Israeli police train American police specifically to murder blacks. Can you believe this? That's Black Lives Matter, a vicious, anti-white, anti-Jewish, anti-Israel, anti-American group. And they openly say they're communists. They say they're trained communists. The leaders say that openly. 
I wrote two uh, op-eds exposing this, and I had the head of the reform movement, Rabbi Rick Jacobs, I name names, uh, the head of the conservative Jewish movement, and 50 other Jewish leaders signed the petition calling me a racist, demanding I be thrown out of the umbrella group, the Conference of Presidents, and I should be thrown out of every Jewish group in America when I simply told the truth about an anti-Semitic group. They defended uh, anti-Semites, the group Black Lives Matter, and attacked me as a racist and said I should be canceled. And several JCRs and Jewish Community Relations Councils, on which I sit as, on the board, uh, uh, tried to throw me off the board. They failed, and all the other attempts failed. But this was a stance of major Jewish leaders uh, uh, defending Black Lives Matter, defending anti-Semites, and condemning me when I was simply reporting who they were. And as I said to them, when I attack Black Lives Matter, I'm not attacking Blacks. I'm attacking this group. When I attack David Duke, I don't attack whites. I attack the Ku Klux Klan. That's not attacking all whites. So I, I've, uh, it's been really quite shocking the way the Jewish world has responded. They're tough as nails, de de defending people who are perceived as left wing. Uh, and they go after people who are perceived as right of center, like me, uh, as strongly as they can. What an upside down world we live in. What a great day November 13th, 2022 was, in my opinion, because at a gala held in New York City, your organization awarded its highest honors to former President Donald Trump. And you gave him credit, you gave him props for being, quote unquote, the best friend Israel ever had in the White House. I definitely think his record uh, deserves that statement. Tell us a little bit about how you gave Trump respect. We are the only significant Jewish group that honored Donald Trump and told him, thank you. Thank you for being the greatest friend Israel has ever had in the White House, ever. We gave him our Theodore Herzl Award. This is an award we've given seven or eight times throughout our history. Yeah, we've given it to David Ben-Gurion, Menachem Begin, Winston Churchill, uh, Lord Balfour. <laughs> so only the, the, made the biggest public officials in the world have received this. And we thought Donald Trump deserved this because he moved the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. He recognized the Golan Heights as being sovereign territory for the Jews. He cut off all the aid to the Palestinian Arabs. Uh, uh, he cut off all the aid to UNRWA. This is a, uh, a UN group that trains Arabs to hate Jews and kill them. It, it's astonishing what I'm saying. Uh, and he made peace uh, with uh, uh, a number of Muslim countries, Bahrain, United Arab Emirates, uh, Sudan, uh, and, and, and Morocco. And uh, 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 so he deserved for Jews to say thank you. And instead, the Jews have never supported him. Uh, maybe 20% of the Jews voted for him. 80% voted for uh, uh, Hillary Clinton, uh, for Joe Biden over Donald Trump even though he's the greatest friend uh, that Israel has ever had. And by the mm. way, he was a pretty good president for America as well. Mm. Things were pretty good in America under Donald Trump. So we honored him. And when he walked in that room in New York City, in Pier 60, he got a five minute standing ovation. They wouldn't stop applauding. It was really something. And Mort, am I correct that you guys even had to turn people away? There was no more room at that event. You couldn't even sell any more tickets. No, it was a, a packed house, a packed house. Uh, part of the packed house was because there was so much media there. <laughs> uh, and I was attacked. So many people called me, uh, condemning me for honoring Donald Trump. I said, look, uh, whatever negatives you perceive of Donald Trump, we honored him for what he did for Israel. That's what we are. We're a pro-Israel group. You do great things for Israel, we will honor you. <laughs> yeah. And... Uh, no, I, I was attacked by many officials, many leaders called me, I won't mention their names, called me up personally and said, you are, you are disgusting to honor such a terrible human being. I, I guess Biden has, a, has, has done a, a much better job running America and, and his relationship with Israel. By the way, Biden, almost every person he's appointed is a friend of Barack Obama's. Mm. I think Barack Obama has a major hand at what's going on because Susan Rice is director of uh, domestic policy. She's a foreign policy person. 
but she's mm. a close friend to Obama. They didn't want to put her in a post that required Senate approval. So they made her director of domestic policy of which she knows nothing. So she'll be inside the White House. And I think reporting back to Obama what's going on. So I think yeah. Obama, Valerie Jarrett and others have a major hand at what's going on uh, with the Biden policies. And we've got Jewish Americans upset at you about the Trump thing. He, the best friend of Israel in terms of being president, Biden gives money to the Palestinian Authority and praises people like Rashida Tlaib. That, that's right. Um, you know, I actually have it here. <laughs> I can't find, I can't put my hands on it right away. Uh, oh, I do. L listen to what he said about Rashida Tlaib, one of the biggest public anti-Semites, Israel haters, we ever saw in Congress. She's a Congresswoman from Michigan. Biden, who was at an event with Tlaib, said this to Rashida Tlaib, I admire your intellect. I admire your passion. I admire your concern for so many other people. From my heart, I pray that your grandmom and family are well. I promise you, I'll do everything to see to it that they're well. You're a fighter. God thanks you for being such a great fighter. Praising a monstrous anti-Semite. It's as if he praised David Duke. As if he praised Louis Farrakhan. She is at that level of hatred. And, and, and this is what he said. And let me tell you, we're the only Jewish group that condemned him for this horrible speech, praising a Jew hater. And by the way, America hater as well. Uh, 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 and yet, uh, this is who we have in the White House. Yeah. And he gets and, there, and he's found no negative consequences for his anti-Israel policies. Uh, we're really the only group that has come out uh, condemning him for this. And thank you for doing that. Thank you for something else. Two more recently in the Jerusalem Post. Very powerful, strong article you wrote about this whole judicial process going on in Israel or reforming the judicial process. Tell us a little bit about that. The Supreme Court in Israel has 15 members. The members are chosen by a committee of nine people, mm -hmm. three of whom are, are sitting Supreme Court justices, two are members of the Israeli Bar Association who are very beholden to Supreme Court justice. So they'll always go along with the other three. That's five out of nine. You need seven out of nine to say yes, to be confirmed as a Supreme Court justice. So sitting justices, have veto power over who gets on the Supreme Court. That's why out of 15 members of the Supreme Court, 13 or 14 are left wing, maybe one is conservative. This is an awful system where these are people who are appointed to be on here, as opposed to the way we do it in America, elected people in the Senate and elected president decide who's in the Supreme Court. It's, that's not perfect, but it's far better than this. <laughs> so the, the judicial reform wants, first of all, wants to change the system. We have much more input from elected officials to pick who's on the Supreme Court hmm. uh, uh, and require standing to go to Supreme Court and, uh, and, 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 and present a case. In other words, in America, you can't just go to the Supreme Court unless it affects you personally or your business. In Israel, you know, some guy who lives uh, in Tel Aviv can just go, go to the Supreme Court even though it doesn't affect him and fight. And, fight. and the most... Uh, controversial thing is this override provision. This, this Israeli government wants to be able to override the Supreme Court decisions. Now, why do they want to do that? The Supreme Court itself has forced this need because the Supreme Court of Israel overrides Israeli law repeatedly. In other words, there's an Israeli law and, and they, they take the stance of reasonableness. They claim this is a legal theory, reasonableness. If we in the Supreme Court think a law is unreasonable, we will not abide by it. Well, that's not their business. The legislature makes the laws. A court has to abide by the legislature, by the law that's passed. But dozens of times, the Supreme Court ignored Israeli law and rule opposing what the law says. I'll give you simply one example. I could give you dozens. One example, there's a law in Israel that if you're an activist fighting uh, uh, for BDS, for boycotting Israel, sanctioning Israel, divesting from Israel, if you're an activist, you're not allowed in the country. They're afraid to have people come in the country and start undermining Israel who are activists in this uh, realm of, of promoting BDS. This is a law. Uh, uh, a, a group 
went, uh, so Ilan Omar and Rashida Tlaib wanted to come to Israel. They were activists on BDS. Uh, uh, they went to uh, people, uh, NGOs, went to the Supreme Court, argued that they should be allowed. The Supreme Court said it is not reasonable that this law doesn't let them in. They can come in, which is absurd. That was the Supreme Court of Israel acts like legislators, not as following the law passed by the legislator. Because of that, for a long time, there's been discussions. We must stop this outrageous policy. <laughs> and, and that's why they say we have to be allowed to override now, right now, they want to. Oh, you right now, the proposal is if 61 out of 120 members of the, of the Israeli parliament uh, vote to override, it's overridden. Uh, but they're uh, look, I know all the leaders there, they're willing to make it a bigger number 65 or 70 to make it a bigger number. And uh, I've talked to them personally, they said we're happy to compromise and make it a bigger number. But the reason there is a need for an override is because the Supreme Court forced this need by overriding and ignoring Israeli law. And that's why support for the Supreme Court in Israel in the last 20 years has gone from 70% support. Now it's down to 40% support mm. because the people see what's happening and they said, you know, they're not following the laws that are being passed by our legislators. Mm. What I've just said is not understood. And I, again, the Israeli leadership should have really explained it in the way I explained it or better and uh, Jewish leaders as well. By the way, Jewish leaders in America have come, almost every major group in America has come out against judicial reform. This is an internal domestic Israeli matter. We have no business uh, saying anything about it. And by the way, many members of Congress uh, have also come out publicly condemning Israel for this reform movement. And President Biden has said this must stop. He's condemned a domestic internal matter. You know, uh, 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 there's many people in Congress promoting expanding the U.S. Supreme Court from nine uh, justices to 13, uh, uh, which, would, of course, would stack the court, suddenly be all very liberal because Biden would be appointing liberal justices suddenly four at a time. Uh, would Israel ever say, don't do this? Never. God forbid. That would be terrible. It's not Israel's business. This is our business if we stack the court. Uh, and yet. This is exactly what Biden and, and members of Congress uh, are doing, is condemning an internal matter of Israel not to do this. And, and the reason this is almost all people on the left that are condemning Israel, because they want the Supreme Court to still be a power for left-wing ideology. Uh, and that's why they don't want any reform here in America. They don't want reform in Israel. And uh, the people on the left in Israel don't want reform because then their left-wing... Uh, power will be dissipated dramatically. Thank you for your truth-telling on, on this matter as well, Mort. And as always, your people like you are fighting an uphill battle. It's just mind-boggling what's going on, especially among Jewish leaders on these issues. And how about the issue of Jerusalem? And so we've got, you know, as we know, this whole international movement and worldwide and everywhere that the Muslims deserve sec a section of Jerusalem, deserve control over parts of Jerusalem. The Jerusalem is somehow holy to Muslims. And you've crystallized the facts on this issue and also taken a lot of heat for doing so. Tell us about that a bit. Jerusalem has been the capital of Israel under King David 3,000 years ago. It has never been the capital of any nation on earth except Israel. When the Arabs conquered Palestine in 716, they made Ramla their capital, not Jerusalem. They knew Jerusalem is the Jewish city. It's a holy Jewish city, but they didn't even make it their capital. Uh, I noticed uh, the, the holy place there, the Temple Mount, which the Arabs claim as theirs. Notice what it's called, the Temple Mount. It's not called the Mosque Mount, is it? Because this is where the two Jewish temples were built on this mount. That's why it's called the Temple Mount. Uh, the majority of people uh, since the first census, 1845 or so, living in Jerusalem are Jews. Since 1845, the majority of people living uh, in, in, in Jerusalem uh, uh, have been Jews. The Jewish holy books mention Jerusalem 700 times, never once in the Koran. How can the holy book of the Muslims, the Koran, not mention Jerusalem if it's a holy city to them? So when I wrote an op-ed about this, I've written many, uh, but one particular one in the Washington Post. Uh, 
citing this and many other uh, uh, facts, uh, they had uh, uh, many people writing in <clears throat> saying, well, Muhammad went from Jerusalem to heaven. So of course it's holy, their prophet Muhammad. Well, the Quran, they say that's what the Quran says. No, the Quran says Muhammad had a dream. Didn't happen. He had a dream that he went uh, from the farthest mosque to heaven. So they say, well, the farthest mosque means Jerusalem. Well, guess what? When the Quran was written, there wasn't a single mosque in Jerusalem. So of course it can't refer to Jerusalem. There are no mosques in Jerusalem. <laughs> so, uh, and even from 48 to 67, when Jordan controlled Jerusalem, they allowed it to be a slum. There was virtually no water, electricity, uh, virtually no plumbing. They destroyed 58 synagogues. Uh, they made life so miserable for Christians. 70% of the Christians left Jerusalem under Jordanian control. And did Jor Jordan make Amman, did make Jerusalem their capital? They made Amman their capital. They built their universities in Amman, Jordan. Uh, they're, they built uh, they, they're, they're Friday prayers. They do it from Amman, not from Jerusalem. So I'm sorry to say, but the truth is, Jerusalem is really not very holy to Muslims. And it's mm -hmm. high time that people say this publicly. And more, more. You've also pointed out how many Arab leaders visited Jerusalem during the 19 years after 48. Only uh, two heads of Jordan visited. Uh, not mm. a single other Arab leader visited Jerusalem when they controlled it for those 19 years. Right. If it's so damn holy, why didn't these Arab leaders go and visit it? Because it's not holy. It's holy to the Jews, possibly the Christians. I don't, I'm not a Christian expert, so I, I can't really talk about it but it's certainly holy to the Jews and there's no evidence that it's holy to, to the Muslims. And that's why, and yet uh, no Jewish leader that I know of, uh, no Israeli leader makes that point. Uh, they're afraid. They're afraid of being called Islamophobic. Uh, uh, who knows what else? But yeah. those are the facts I've written about this. And let me tell you, a major Middle East expert, I don't know if I should mention his name, uh, a very famous man, distinguished, gave a speech about Jerusalem, talking about its holiness to Muslims without any evidence, just saying, citing it. And I went over to him afterwards and I said, I went through some of these things and I said, professor, it's not holy to Muslims. I went through these things and he, know what he, he whispered in my ear. He said, look, I have to say that. If I don't, they'll never invite me to speak in any Muslim country. <laughs> this is a famous, famous scholar in the Middle East. I'll tell you afterwards if you want who that is. You have pointed out, you are a scholar, you have pointed out that Judaism's sacred texts cite Jerusalem more than 700 times. And more, when it all comes down to it, the Lord gave Jerusalem to the Jewish people. And uh, on the holiday, just, uh, we just finished the uh, Passover. We end the holiday saying next year in Jerusalem. Uh, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, we end that those holiday saying next year in Jerusalem. Uh, as I said, the majority of people living there since... Uh, 18, 1840s were Jews. In fact, I have a better first guide to Jerusalem. It's the oldest travel book company in the world, as I mentioned before. The 1907 Guide to Jerusalem it says there were 60,000 people in Jerusalem in this guide. It says 13,000 uh, Christians, 7,000 Muslims, 40,000 Jews. 1907, the two-thirds of the people living there were Jewish. If it was so holy to them, Middle East is filled with the Muslims all over the place. They'd be moving there, but they're not. It's not holy to them. Mecca and Medina are their holy cities, not Jerusalem. They just want to take the Judaism's heart and soul away from us by taking Jerusalem away from us. It is yes. not a holy uh, city to them. They, yes. have, they have a holy mosque there, but the city is not holy. More Jewish leaders are very upset with you for saying these things. Jewish leaders very upset for you inviting Donald Trump. How upset were they? Are they? How much have they talked about and expressed their moral indignation about Obama's photo with Louis Farrakhan standing together with him? Everything he did to empower the Palestinian Authority. Uh, I mean, Obama's record is just atrocious in terms of Israel and the Jewish people, his hostility to Jews. Um, what do you think about the Jewish leadership's silence in terms of Obama on all of this, if they really cared? It was disgraceful. It shows the Jewish leadership is not protecting 
uh, what their mission is, protecting the Jews or Israel, when you had so many so extraordinarily hostile to Israel and Jews as Obama, <laughs> in a meeting at the White House, which I attended, and I was sitting three seats away from him, <laughs> he said to us, you Jewish leaders need to speak to your friends and relatives in Israel, and you need to ha have them and you search your souls to see if you're really serious about peace. I don't think you are. But Mahmoud Abbas is sincere about peace, and everyone knows it. I'm giving you exact quotes, and everyone knows it. You can keep the Jewish areas of Jerusalem. You can't keep the Arab areas. I, this, I leaked this out. It was written in articles, and Jewish leaders were called about it. They said, not true. He didn't say it. They refused to acknowledge that that's what he said. They never criticized him to any extent at all, even... When the month before he left office, in December of his last term in office, he organized and got passed in the Security Council, which is where the laws are made, a resolution 2334 that says every inch of land past the 67 line, meaning Jerusalem, the Temple Mount, the Jewish sector in Jerusalem, Hadassah Hospital, Hebrew University, this is Arab occupied land. This passed. Uh, in the in the in the Security Council and Barack Hussein Obama refused to veto it, Ref so it became law. This this caused me to write an article saying it is now unfortunately clear he is a hater of the Jewish people and the Jewish state. Yeah. Well, more you more you've also made it clear that Obama didn't want Israel to have an anti-missile system, the Iron Dome, and you have also stressed that during that. Uh, speech he gave in Cairo where he brought peace to the world. Who was in the front two rows that even Mubarak didn't want sitting there? Boy, it's a, a, your knowledge about this is astonishing to me. I've forgotten all this stuff. <laughs> the Muslim Brotherhood, the radical, radical Muslim group, Muslim Brotherhood was sitting in the front rows. He made the speech at a radical, at a Muslim Brotherhood university. Mubarak begged him not to invite these people or he won't come. Barack Obama invited them, and Mubarak did not show up because of that. And that was in his first days of the presidency, in his first days. And even the Iran deal, the Iran deal that he proposed, and, and uh, even though it was a treaty, he would not refuse to treat it as a treaty because then it would require two thirds of a vote in the Senate would never pass. This deal, even he openly said, in 13 years, there'll be no restrictions on Iran. Uh, 13 years after this this uh, agreement is signed. And people said, well, then they'll be able to get nukes then. No, don't worry. By then they'll moderate and they'll be okay. So this deal they made gave a road, an opening, a means for, for Iran to get nuclear weapons legally. That's how hostile he is uh, to Israel yeah. and even to the world, even to the world. Yeah. More, we've got to go just in the next couple of minutes. Let's just... Before we go, just very quickly on just a couple of things I want to pick your brain on. Um, Trump, obviously, great friend of Israel and just was a great president. I hope he'll be president again. I love Donald Trump. You've also said that Ron DeSantis is, is great on the Jewish people and on the Jewish issue in Israel. Just tell us a little bit about DeSantis on this issue. DeSantis was one of my closest friends when he was in Congress. He would call me and say, they haven't moved the embassy yet, Mort. What should we do? That he, uh, Pre President Trump hasn't recognized the Golan yet. He said he would. He hasn't done it. And I said, Congressman DeSantis, hold hearings. And each time he held hearings on the Golan, on Jerusalem and such, and each time he held hearings on that issue, he spoke out strongly of the need to recognize Golan, to move the embassy to Jerusalem. He always had me testify because he knew I would be very strong. <laughs> so... Uh, uh, <laughs> I've really never met almost anyone in public uh, life who's as strongly pro-Israel as uh, Ron DeSantis. He's really wow. extraordinary. And by the way, his yeah. first trip out of the country as governor was to Israel, and he asked me to join him. I went with him to Israel. It was his first mm. trip. He had his first cabinet meeting in Jerusalem with his cabinet from Florida, and he made deals with Israeli universities, Israeli uh, companies, with Florida universities and companies. Uh, uh, now, this man, his heart is in, for strong U.S.-Israel relations. And uh, of that, there's no doubt. 
more you've met a lot of people in the world. You've got a lot of friends. Uh, I was very interested. You had John Voigt at one of your events. And I was very interested that Ice Cube is a friend of yours. Could you just tell us a bit about that? <laughs> Not only is he a friend of mine, we honored him at our dinner three or four years ago. Uh, and he publicly condemned anti-Semitism. And, uh, and he praised the away for fighting for our people in, in, a, in a way he fights for his people, for the black people. Mm. So uh, I, met, I met his manager at a party and I started telling him how upset I, and he told me that he manages Ice Cube. And I said, in the nineties, Ice Cube made many uh, very terrible statements about, uh, mm. about Jews. And he said, no, we didn't. And he went over them and explained to him what they really were. And he oh. said, look, will you talk to him? I said, of course I will. Well, when, what, where, how are you talking? I said, tell him to call me tomorrow at two o'clock. Two o'clock came. Ice Cube called me. We spoke for two hours. And the first thing I said to him, I said, uh, Mr. Mr. Uh, I said, Mr. Ice Cube. He said, no, no. Cube. I said, it's hard for me to call someone Cube. Can I call you like Alan? <laughs> so he said, call me Cube. I said, Cube, we have something in common. The first thing I said to him, we both grew up in a black ghetto in the black hood, which I did, and so did he. So as soon as I said that, we really connected, and we had a two-hour conversation, and uh, we've met many times since. Uh, so he's become a good friend. He's a good man. He's a very good man. More Klein, all good things must come to an end, including a conversation with Mort Klein. We got to go. It was an honor to have you on the show. Thank you for being such a brave and courageous fighter for the truth, for freedom, for America, for Israel. For those people on the edge of their seats right now watching this show, and they might not know how to get in touch or support you, where do they go? Well, go to zoa.org, zoa.org. You'll learn about all, all the things that we've discussed are all on that website. And of course, we urge you to uh, support our work because uh, the bigger uh, we are, the more credible and the more effective our positions uh, are. So your supporting us financially and in other ways will only uh, allow us to be to promote our this uh, rational and reasonable and appropriate agenda more forcefully. So I thank you yeah. for that. I thank you, Dr. Glazov, for having me and for all of your work through Front Page Mag and all sorts of, of your other, uh, and I love hearing your Canadian accent. Let's go to Tim Hortons. Abe, what are you talking about? <laughs> what are you talking about, eh? Okay, uh, more Klein, it was an honor. Please come back on the Glasov Gang anytime you like, okay? I'd love to. Thank you so much. Okay, good night. Good night. And thank you for joining the Glasov Gang this evening. We'll see you soon.